Okay, so um, so with the advent of the Classic getting older, and by this stage they had the uh, <coughs> 7 7 400 as well, but they were looking at something which would uh, replace the TriStar. And uh, so they looked at the Airbus and they decided then to buy the 340 for uh, long thin routes, the four engine one for ultra long haul, and the 330 for the regional routes. And I ended up going on to the uh, 330 in 1994. And uh, by this stage I was in uh, check and training. So uh, they wanted me to go over there and do one of the early courses at Toulouse and then come back and train the other pilots on uh, how to fly the aeroplane. <coughs> so that was a very interesting course because uh, when you get a factory course with a brand new aeroplane, it doesn't come with any of the airline culture. They just tell you how to fly the aeroplane mm -hmm. and you make up your own procedures. And we didn't know anything about the Airbus. Um, everybody who went on the course either came from a 747 Classic or a TriStar. Uh, none of which was glass. So we were all new at it and we just all muddled on through and we, uh, we made it up as we went along. And uh, the simulator instructors, you know, said, uh, you do whatever procedure you like. You know? So it was, it was good fun. So we were over there in Toulouse for seven weeks uh, doing the course and the uh, simulator. And then we came back and we actually didn't have an aeroplane for about three months because they had some uh, uh, problems with testing and things. There was a few delays. And uh, so we all got very uncurrent, and then we, when the aeroplane did arrive, we had to then rush out to go and get ourselves current again and fly the aeroplane. Um, then they had the aeroplanes coming thick and fast after that, and I think in the first year we had to train um, 174 pilots in 12 months. Uh, and we had, an, we had an aeroplane coming every month uh, for the first year, so by the end of the year we had 12 aeroplanes. So Where were you doing your training? Where were we doing our training? Yeah. Uh, we, we did our um, simulator training in Toulouse. And yeah. then we did our base training, just the circuit training. We actually went to Utapau in Thailand, which is oh. a nice straight old B-52 runway from Vietnam War. And it was nice and quiet, it was long and straight, and there was no traffic around. So we managed to check out 28 guys in the first day, uh, <laughs> doing circuits and bumps there. And then uh, and, uh, we were all qualified, and then, and then they said, well, OK, you go out and do six sectors, and then you were a training captain on the aeroplane. We, we had six sectors more than the people we were training, so it was, it was a blind lead in the blind. It was very interesting in the, in the early days, and it wasn't about its problems because it was a brand new aeroplane. We were having engine problems, we were having computer problems, all sorts of things. So, interesting. Well, 343. We had the 340 300 and the 330 300. Yeah, that's right. And, and basically, we're the, we were the first airline, we're still the only airline in the world that actually uh, cross crew qualify, and we fly both types which is a special qualification uh, where you basically learn to fly on one, once you've got experience on that, you do a conversion on the other, and then you've got uh, recency requirements to be able to fly both. So, uh, and, and they're very similar in how they fly, uh, but you know, the fact is one's got four little engines and the other one's got two dirty great big ones. <laughs> and uh, the, the 330 is actually the better aeroplane uh, because it's actually got more power, uh, more excess power. We used to call the 340 the, uh, the Bentley and the 330 the Maserati. Yeah. <laughs> the difference in performance, the 340 was rather pedestrian. You know, but it went a long way, it went too far. <laughs> it goes about 16 hours. You know. uh, this aeroplane has less uh, endurance, only goes about 10. So in in awesome. your training, in initial training, mm -hmm. relying on sort of uh, fly-by-wire, mm -hmm. when did you start being aware of flying without the wire? <laughs> Well, it's, I don't think it's anything any that ever came up as an issue. Everyone that, you know, uh, sort of said, oh, how can you fly an aeroplane and you don't have any correct linkage between your hand and the uh, control services? But you actually had five computers. And uh, although computers are notoriously unreliable, the chances of having five independent failures when they're independently written software and independent power systems uh, failing simultaneously is so remote, it's uh, not yeah. worth worrying about. And any one computer will fly the aeroplane. So yeah. we never really worried about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a very easy aeroplane to fly because, uh, you know, uh, fly by wire I means it's like point and shoot, it's like playing a video game. Mm -hmm. you, you select the attitude, you hold it where you want it for a couple of seconds, it auto trims out, you let the stick go and it stays there. Mm -hmm. It just keeps going. It's a little auto stability, auto trim. So it's a very nice aeroplane from that point of view. Easiest aeroplane I've ever flown. Yeah. But the uh, <coughs> computer side of it, you know, the flight management system uh, has some interesting little things about it. It's quite complex in uh, how you manage the modes of uh, the autopilot. How do the computers compare in that with the caribou? What computers? <laughs> 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 well, caribou yeah. fly by wire too. There was a wire going from the control room. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. So quite different aeroplanes. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I've been. I'm still on the 330 now. So I've been on it since 1994. I've probably got just about 10,000 hours on it now. And uh, I actually was able to come back and live in Adelaide in uh, 1996. So I've been living here ever since. So the company brought out basings to try and reduce the costs of the number of pilots who live in Hong Kong because housing there is very expensive. And one of the ways of reducing the costs of is to move some of your pilots out of Hong Kong to the, uh, the, the outlying ports uh, which we operate to. So we have about four, five hundred pilots now that are uh, living offshore, about uh, 200 in Australia and about uh, 300 in Europe and North America. And we've got about two and a half thousand pilots all together. How many Chinese pilots are? About 350, 400 now. Right. Yeah, yeah. And there's probably a hundred of those now with the captains. Including one female. How do they write? Well, we train them, they're good. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, everyone worried about that. You know, when they first announced that they were going to get Chinese pilots, which was in 1988, and I think it was in response to the handover looming, you know, the 1997 handover, and everyone thought, well, if CAFO don't put some training scheme in, uh, in place, before the handover, they're sure the PLA will afterwards, you know, yeah. we'll have, uh, you know, one hung low Chinese fighter pilot trying to show us how to fly an Airbus, you know, and it's like, no, that's not going to happen. So we put our own um, training scheme in place, and the cadets were originally trained in Creswick in Scotland for a few first few years, and then since the early 90s, they've been out here at Carrefour, which you probably know, flight training Adelaide. And we have uh, over 100 students here at any one time now going through that course. Um, so, they fly to the same standard as anybody else. You know, we, we've always said that uh, you know, we're, we're going to be impartial and we're not going to do any favours and they, they are going to come up with a standard of everybody else. And they, they have, they do. They might have slightly different styles and things like that, everyone's yeah. individual, but they fly to the same standard as everybody else does. So I'll put my wife and kids on their aeroplane, no problem. Yes. Just a question, the yeah. students that graduate from Parafield, what's their entry point into Cathay? Second what officer. Role? Second officer which is uh, basically on the heavy crews, the ultra long haul flights. Yep. You carry a heavy crew, so the minimum crew is two pilots, and depending on the length of the flight, you then add either one or two more. Right. And uh, one of those will be a second officer. Right. So that's their role. So they, they come out basically as an apprentice, yep. and uh, they only operate in the seat in the crews, yep. uh, and they maintain their currency in the simulator until they operate the first officer. So that's just 747 and 340? Uh, no, 777 as well. Okay. And uh, and in fact, after they've been on the A340 for 18 months, they CCQ onto the 330, because we, we operate a three-man crew between Hong Kong and Australia. Right. I came down this morning with a um, three-man crew. Yeah. So, uh, so all the Australian ports except for Perth uh, have a three-man crew as well. And that's that's the second officer as well. Yeah, okay. <coughs>